Welcome. I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. We start this week in Boston, where Nancy Giles met up with Ibram X. Kendi to talk about his ongoing efforts to erase racism in America. Kendi is the founder of the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University, where he's a history professor. Why is it not enough to not be a racist as opposed to being an anti-racist? Well, I think it's important for people to know the opposite of being racist is being anti-racist. Kendi has argued for being anti-racist in a series of best-selling books. No one is inherently racist or anti-racist. It's about what we're doing. And so when we're expressing that the racial groups are equals, we're being anti-racist. When we're supporting a policy that is leading to a racial disparity, we're, we're being racist. You know, I'm encouraging people to constantly think about what are we doing <laughs> or even not doing. There's more from their powerful conversation coming up a little later in the show. So as a child, as a youngster, do you, you said that you adopted some racist thinking yourself. Was that, again, based on how you were treated or what you observed? I think it was the result of coming of age in the 1990s. And if there was ever a decade in, in American history when black youth, black urban youth, mm. were considered a menace to society, mm. were, were considered the American problem, were considered super predators. Super predators, You know, yeah. were, were, were considered all sorts of, it was the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people in both political parties, I don't, I don't think people of many different races realized the impact those ideas were having on us, <laughs> on the kids who were coming of age, who were being constantly told we're the problem. Then, Faith Saley brings us the vivid colors and dazzling displays of artist Romero Brito in his adopted hometown of Miami. With the Miami sun and surf as his backdrop, Brito began adding more color. The brighter the palette, the more people were drawn to the work. Corporate partnerships and multiple licensing deals followed. You really can't talk about Brito art without bringing up Brito Inc., which the company says generates $250 million in retail sales annually. The Brito Barbie came during the World Cup and she's, you know, she's ready to play, you know, soccer with the stilettos. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. she's got heels on. <laughs> How do you feel about some art critics who don't take your work seriously? A lot of people think that the, the art has to be, you know, depressed, you know, to be serious. You know, so I just don't pay attention for that. I just do my art. He does his art in this 60,000 square foot building, dubbed the Brito Palace by the artist and the 90 employees who work here. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Ibram X. Kendi is a professor and best-selling author, but his ideas have become polarizing, as we saw recently during the nomination hearings for Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. He spoke with our Nancy Giles about the theme of much of his work, the importance of being anti-racist. We're at one of the most historic spaces for black people in, in North America. Mm -hmm. We met Ibram X. Kendi along Boston's Black Heritage Trail. Abolitionists were gathering, and, and what kind of things were they discussing? They were discussing what was unheard of in the 19th century, which was a nation without slavery, the immediate emancipation of all enslaved people. The African Meeting House is the oldest black church in the country, built in 1806. You had abolitionists saying to the American people, you can't expect to end chattel slavery mm -hmm. by doing nothing. The more you do nothing, <laughs> the, the more slavery spreads mm -hmm. and harms and tortures and kills. And in many ways, that's what's happening right now. If we don't actively seek to be anti-racist, then racism will persist. In the sanctuary, positive things happen. Kendi is the founder of the Center for Anti-Racist Research at Boston University, where he's a history professor. Why is it not enough to not be a racist as opposed to being an anti-racist? 
Well, I think it's important for people to know the opposite of being racist is being anti-racist. Kendi has argued for being anti-racist in a series of best-selling books. No one is inherently racist or anti-racist. It's about what we're doing. And so when we're expressing that the racial groups are equals, we're being anti-racist. When we're supporting a policy that is leading to a racial disparity, we're, we're being racist. You know, I'm encouraging people to constantly think about what are we doing <laughs> or even not doing. Bigots, racists, like Ibrahim Kendi. His views have been polarizing, to say the least. How to be an anti-racist. His work was injected into the hearings for Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. Anti-racist baby by I Ibram Kendi. Courtesy of Senator Ted Cruz. One portion of the book says babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. There is no neutrality. It is dangerous to tell the truth today. I would know. <laughs> But, but, but as we've learned in the last few years, it is dangerous to not tell the truth. For people who are like, oh, slavery was over 200 years ago. Why, why are we going back to that? Things are level now. It's a level playing field. Well, first, if it was a level playing field, there would not be all these racial disparities from health to wealth to education to incarceration. Or you think there is a level playing field, and the reason why certain racial groups are less wealthy, or more likely to be poor, or more likely to die, or more likely to be incarcerated is because there's something inferior about them. Mm -hmm. I don't think that any racial group is inferior or superior. And so what that means is there isn't a level playing field. And then the question becomes, why isn't there a level playing field? And you can't answer that question without talking about the present and the history mm -hmm. of this country. And you can't talk about American history without talking about slavery. Kendi has two new books coming out aimed at children and parents. One is a takeoff on the classic book, Good Night Moon. The moon sees all kids. Whoever they are. Whoever they are. His six-year-old daughter, Imani, recorded the audiobook with some coaching from dad. The moon delights. When every child falls asleep. When every child falls asleep. Including Imani? Including Imani. It's not a coincidence that racist ideas have spread across time and across humanity. The reason why they have is because they're simple. Dark is ugly. Light is good. Dark people are bad. Light people are smart. These are very simple ideas that even a two or three or four year old can understand. And studies are showing that even preschool children are choosing who to play with based on skin color. The new books are being released as teaching about racism is under fire. I see our schools going down a dark path. With some states passing laws to take books out of schools that might make students uncomfortable. I think that arming our children with information is protective. Kendi is married to Dr. Sadika Kendi, a pediatric emergency room physician. That applies when it comes to arming them with understanding our history, like a true account of our history, helping them to learn about racism and about anti-racism. And with Imani, her knowing this is what it is, this is the work that your father is doing. And unfortunately, because of that, there are people who don't like him and who don't like our family. The book is garbage. Actually, it's worse than that. Not only is it embarrassingly stupid, it is poisonous. When we're crossing the, the street with our two-year-old, we teach them look both mm -hmm, ways, mm -hmm. make sure there's not a car coming. Similarly, we have to teach them that there's these cars of racist ideas that are, that are coming that could hit you. Good night, hate. Good night, hate. Good night, hurt. With his daughter for inspiration, Ibram X. Kendi is looking back to history. Good night. Good night. <laughs> and looking forward for generations to come. Good job, Missy. Good job. Good job. More with Ibram X. Kendi coming up in just a few minutes. After the break, we head to Miami, a city whose glitz and glamour feel perfectly paired with the style of an artist who calls it home. His vivid colors have adorned gallery walls, of course, but also brightened up the likes of sports cars, Barbie dolls, and top shelf spirits, just to name a few. But as Faith Saley learned, the man behind the brand has a life story as unique as his art.
In artist Romero Brito's world, every surface evokes a smile, and a gaze in any direction lifts the spirits. His colorful creations have made it to the Super Bowl, the World Cup, and the Olympics, as well as cruise ships and onto, well, cars that cruise. Hi! Nice car! But there is one place that Brito is everywhere. To, to look at you, you, you are Miami. <laughs> oh, thank you. Miami sidewalks and skyline glitter with Britos. Over the years, he's been asked to design and decorate city vehicles, parking meters, hospitals, even lottery tickets. Brito Scratch Offs, the art of winning. Why do you think Miami has embraced you? I think because the people that make this city, also the spirit is very happy. And most of the people that move here, they come here to make a new beginning or something sort of like that. Romero Brito was one of them, leaving behind the Brazilian favelas or slums. Born in 1963, he was raised by a single mother with nine children to feed, which wasn't always easy. Like summertime in Brazil, there is a moment that there's a lot of ants and we, we used to eat ants. You would eat ants? Yes, yeah, fried ants with butter. Like it's a big ant, so. You know, I, one thing I had to say is that all this difficult time that I have growing up, my art was always there for me. He saved enough money to make it to Miami, but not much else. Too poor for canvas, his early work was done on newspaper and sold on the sidewalk. It was really tough. Why? Well, because imagine a, a young guy, a young person, not knowing what's going to happen in the future, you know, it's just like, you're just like trying to find a place in the world. And I was, as an artist, I was trying, you know, to find a place for myself. With the Miami sun and surf as his backdrop, Brito began adding more color. The brighter the palette, the more people were drawn to the work. His vivid pop art style caught the eye of an executive who, in 1989, was looking for artists to design print ads for his vodka campaign. Alongside Absolute Herring and Absolute Warhol would be Absolute Brito. Why did the Absolute ad change everything? If you do one painting and somebody have, let's say you have in your house, only your close friends can come and see it. Yeah. But now you're gonna put like in front of millions of people in, a, in magazines, it's much better, right? Corporate partnerships and multiple licensing deals followed. You really can't talk about Brito Art without bringing up Brito Inc., which the company says generates $250 million in retail sales annually. The Brito Barbie came during the World Cup, and she's, you know, she's ready to play, you know, soccer with the stilettos. Yeah, I was about to say, yeah. she's got heels on. <laughs> Do you think that there should be no line between art and commercialization? But think about it. everything is commercialized. I mean, what is not commercialized? If you're going to go to any museum, they have a store. What, what is wrong for an artist to be able to be part of that? And while the Pope might sip tea from a Brito cup, not everyone thinks Brito's work is a blessing. So how do you feel about some art critics who don't take your work seriously? A lot of people think that the the art has to be, you know, depressed, you know, to be serious. You know, so I just don't pay attention for that. I just do my art. He does his art in this 60,000 square foot building, dubbed the Brito Palace by the artist and the 90 employees who work here. It bursts with products, new pieces and memorabilia. And it's also the place where Brito comes every day to put the finishing touches on his creations. You call these burritos where you sign no, your name? Like this, like this. The, I mean, the, some pieces, sometimes I do like, I repeat my name many times, you know, but, uh, or maybe just the last two T's. It's actually, this is the first time that I did a, a painting of a brush because the brush is so helpful, right? I mean, and um, so I'm celebrating the brush in here, so. And there was a time when you were too poor to, to use brushes. Brush. I know, yeah, I know not have a lot of brushes, which is great. <laughs> I should think so. No, I have lots of brushes. 
is there racial inequality in this country? I keep going back to that. I, I get and, it. And the reason I keep going back More from that. Nancy Giles' conversation with professor and author Ibram X. Kendi, coming up right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Here's more with Ibram X. Kendi. The book you wrote, your recent book, Stamped, it talks about racist and racist theories that go back centuries, and a lot of it's vicious. Does it get tiring for you? Do you get frustrated or uh, upset spending so much time going through that very grim, horrible history? I, I think it is certainly not easy. It's certainly, you know, difficult. But I, I keep going back to what's, what's more difficult for me is to think about that there is a parent whose four-year-old black girl came home and said, I want to be white. And that parent doesn't know how to respond to mm. that. Mm. Or the parent of a 13-year-old white boy who they learned has been sort of talking with white supremacists online, and they don't really know what to do. That's what actually hurts me. That's what sort of drives me, you know, particularly now to talk about race and kids. That's what sort of pushed me to write How to Raise you know, an anti-racist. And so I try to consistently focus on the struggles that, that everyday people are having because that's what gets me up each day. You know, even though it's hard to do this work, I mean, it's hard for doctors, you know, to diagnose people and treat people with cancer, but it's necessary to do. Yeah. So I'm thinking, I know a lot of reactions to your work have brought out a lot of good in people and some of the worst in people. I know that you, you know, You've had death threats. You've had, it's changed your life in some ways. Has it not? It has. Um, but How are you reacting to that? Well, first, I, I know that when you defend human beings who are being hunted, when you defend black people who are being hunted, you become a target. And, and I, I recognize that. And, and I, I, that's the unfortunate part you know, of this work. Uh, but at the same time, I can't forget that people are dying, that people are being harmed, that, that people don't have opportunity, that people are lacking resources. And so that's what constantly sort of drives me to get up each day and, and continue to, to sort of speak from the standpoint of scholarship that we have a problem here and it's racism. So as a child, as a youngster, do you, you said that you adopted some racist thinking yourself. Was that, again, based on how you were treated or what you observed? I think it was the result of coming of age in the 1990s. And if there was ever a decade in, in American history when black youth, black urban youth, mm. were considered a menace to society, mm. were, were considered the American problem, were considered super predators. Super predators, you yeah. know, were, were, were considered all sorts of, it was the 1990s. Mm -hmm. and, I don't think people in both political parties, I don't, I don't think people of many different races realize the impact those ideas were having on us, <laughs> on the kids who were coming of age, who were being constantly told we're the problem. People fearing us, 15 and 16 year old, you know, black teens, what that was causing us to think about ourselves. And, and ultimately, I, I think that I ended up consuming those ideas, that I was a problem, that black people were the problem. And, you know, certainly I did by the time I graduated high school. And in, in that way, you were also associating like they're good, good black people, bad mm -hmm. black people, the same, the same kind of things that the outer groups were doing. Yeah, I was imagining, you know, once I started to have some, quote, success, I started imagining myself as extraordinary. I was not like those ordinary inferior black people. I was imagining myself as exceptional. The, the, I was an exception to the rule of black inferiority. And, and I think that, that, you know, it took me a very long time to realize that I was just as equal as every other, you know, uh, person, whether they look like me or don't look like me. When there's talk about affirmative action or reparations that that's like playing the race card or something like that. Um, that it's making everything about race and, and we should just move on from those ideas. Where do you stand on affirmative action, 
quote unquote affirmative action, which is an interesting way of calling it, and reparations? Well, I think the first question is, is there racial inequality in this country? I keep going back to that. I, I get and, it. And the reason I keep going back to that is because we have to start conversations about race with that. We have racial inequality. We have racial inequity. We have a massive racial wealth gap. And then the next question is, why? <laughs> right? Why, why is that so? Why do we have a massive racial wealth gap? And studies consistently show, from economists to sociologists to historians, uh, show that the cause of the racial wealth gap is a whole host of racist policies, mm -hmm. you know, from redlining, you know, to enslavement, to all the way up to this, to this day. And so if we don't acknowledge that, that there has been harm done, and that that harm needs to be repaired, but if you deny the source of the, the inequity and claim, again, that the playing field is level, then I can understand how a person would say, why reparations? Right. Why affirmative action? Mm -hmm. Everything is equal. Right. You're just you know, providing people with specific racial preferences, which is to say that the cause of those disparities are what's wrong with those people. And I think the I challenge can. is, before the civil rights movement, there was an expression. There was no problem politically with people saying the cause of those inequalities the cause of that inequity or the inferiority of black people or that native people are, are, are savages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, there was not political sort of cost for doing that. Now people don't say that. Instead, what they say is they reject efforts to reduce those inequities by saying that the, level, the playing field is level, which means a particular racial group is inferior. But they, they figure out ways because they know once you start talking about racial hierarchy, you're being racist. So they're trying to all sorts of ways to play gymnastics um, you know, in this time, and, and, and I think we have to identify it. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.